that page still open, you don't have to have it open, but uh, that is a tremendous song. Mm -hmm. teaches a very um, great truth. It says, living for Jesus, a life that is true. Um, one that is, is trying its best to hit the mark. It says, striving to please him in all that I do. I'm telling you, the, the, what it teaches here, yielding allegiance, glad hearted and free. How often do we complain about yielding to God the things that we should graciously and happily yield to Him? Um, every part of, of this song is just a tremendous song on truly how to live for Christ and the things that we need to deal with in our life to get there. Um, it's just, you know, when I read in the reframe, in the course or whatever, O oh Jesus, Lord and Savior. Jesus was the man, the Lord is the sovereign, and the Savior is the Christ who came and died for me. You know, everything in here portrays something. Um, I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. I, I, could, I could preach a sermon out of this one. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Sure, sure. And... And that's, that's the tremendous blessing, really, of, um, uh, of having godly hymns mm -hmm. and psalms is, is they back up the teaching of the Word of God. If they don't, we have a problem with what we're singing. We have a, a problem with what we're trying to glorify God. And I say trying because you, you can't, you just can't, boy, you can't glorify God uh, just by chanting some course over and over and over again. Uh, we will deal with some of that. Maybe we'll get to it today. I think we might. Um, we'll see. Anyway, plan on uh, finishing up Judges chapter 9. It shouldn't be too much a problem to do that. Um, we had ended up in, in, in verse 54. Uh, we were, had so well started into that. Um, I'll give a, a, just a few minutes if there's anybody has a testimony they'd like to give this morning or praise of something God has done this past week. I would um, be happy to give you time if anybody has anything they'd like to say. Uh, if not, yes ma'am. We're praising God that um, 
to allow me to help my mom out yesterday. Mm -hmm. Amen. I see you're driving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's another thing. Huge. <laughs> Is it well, um? Well, that gave me the opportunity to go and help my mom too. So. Uh, when you said your mom, I figured, you know, but I did see the car. So praise the Lord, all that's done and taken care of. Amen. Yes. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So he made it, but the truck didn't. Well, the truck made it, and he made it, but uh, we were a little nervous, so I'm thankful that people prayed and that the front end didn't go like this or something along the way, so it didn't get in there. What was it? Uh, when, when the truck goes unhappy, we all get nervous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, this is just a side note, but I remember in one of my youth, and I won't even say who the young man was, but uh, the young man had a car, and the the, the tie rod ends had gone bad, and the, the end of them were dropping off the ball joints. He fixed it himself. He was a rod buster, and he tied wire around it. And continued driving. Yeah. And when he'd stop, if it fell off, he'd crawl back under there and tie it back up. And I'm like, God has been gracious to him. <laughs> Today he's saved. He wouldn't do that. But anyway. <laughs> but, you know, we do a lot of foolish things in our youth that God protects us through. Yes, ma'am. One of my favorite verses is, God preserves the simple. Yes. <laughs> I praise the Lord for being simple because he's preserving me. <laughs> God has been very gracious to us. Even we don't, we don't give him credit. He's been very gracious to us. All right, there is no other ones. Uh, all right, um, if you would, chapter 9 and going down to verse 54. And it says, He called hastily unto the young man his armor bearer and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me that men say not of me. A woman uh, slew him and his young man thrust him through and he died. We talked about this being a tragic ending for a tragic life. A life that was lived um, seeking self-glorification. Uh, this unknown woman, this certain woman may not have um, taken his life, but he sure ended his reign of terror and brought about his untimely demise. Um, and forcing in the end him to die in humiliation uh, and, and the greatest humiliation to me is, uh, looking at, at Abimelech, is he desired uh, to preserve his vanity. And, and that's what he was after. But yet his humiliation has been recorded for all eternity. God did not honor that. But he was not an honorable man. Um, uh, another truth that I, I see in this, and... and um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of this. I, I told you before. There's a lot of rabbit trails. Or a lot of thoughts. There's a lot of little rabbit burrows we can get in and and and, and set for a while. But I, as I was looking at this, um, I understand the truth of if we continue to serve the flesh by living uh, our lives outside of God's will, uh, there's a good chance that uh, we can come to an untimely death, at least one a death that is not one we desire. Now, with that said. Uh, there are times when Christians die and it's considered an untimely death. I can remember in my youth there was a young uh, man. I did not know him. I knew of him. Uh, very distant and very, not very personal at all. It was just uh, some things that were said. And he was supposedly, uh, I say supposedly because I really don't know him. Uh, he's supposedly a very godly young man. And he died probably... Uh, before he reached 20 in a car wreck. And so everybody was running around questioning why God would allow this. Such an untimely death. You don't know what he would have done in his life. And I said, that's the point. I didn't realize that till later, but God may have preserved his testimony in that untimely death. We don't know. We don't know what God was doing. Um, some people said, well, he's just too good for earth. <clears throat> I won't even comment on that um, because a lot of these things are said in emotion and in the struggle of trying to, to grieve and, and, and get through this. Um, all I can say is we don't know why God does what he does in all the situations. But we're not really ones that have to understand. 
God doesn't say you must understand. God says you must trust and obey. And, and in that, <clears throat> will we struggle? Sure. Is there something wrong with struggling? No. It's in the struggles you grow. It's in the struggles you, you, you search the Word of God and, and learn more about God and, and, and come out on the other side more the child of God. So there's nothing really wrong with the struggle. Um, but we need to understand there are um, premature deaths that are, uh, could be humiliating uh, because of those that live a, God, uh, live a life that's not of God. You know, I, I started because of this, because of what happened to him and his death and, and the way he died. I spent a little time thinking about uh, people in my past that I knew that had died. And, and, and whether they were Christian or, or, or non-Christian in their testimonies, in, in the type of death um, they lived. I can remember uh, certain believers who had gotten, I believe they were believers anyway, and they'd gotten away from God and, and the deaths they had. And, and I remember um, uh, some uh, believers that died young, and I remember some that died old. And in my opinion, and I'm uh, put it like that, because everybody has uh, people that have died and, and how they viewed them, it seemed to me that those that die in the arms of the Lord die a lot more peaceful death. Or is, is there sorrow and grief? Sure. But when I look, even reading through the Word of God, and I understand there is a truth that those that will put themselves in the arms of God, even though they may die, they die a different death than those that are alienated from God or those that have never accepted Christ. Um, I was always taught, I believe this to be true, that a saved person that is apart from God, not living for God, a common Christian, when they die, they die the same death as a person who's unsaved, a natural man. Have you ever heard that? Anybody ever heard that? Why would they say that? Why is that saying like that? A lot of pastors. I've heard this a lot since I was coming up. But there's a truth in it, and I believe it's true. Why would you say that? Exactly. If you're in sin, mm -hmm. where's your relationship with God? How can God comfort and take you through difficult times if you do not have a relationship with Him? See what I'm saying? They, you build a wall between you and God with your sin. As much as he would want to, and he's always there to, do, to, to take you through, uh, are there times when you walk yourself through the valleys and hard times because you're unwilling to repent of the sins? So, yeah, uh, but there's a difference. And you had your hand up? Well, in, in that case, I'm, I'm thinking of when... In a, in a case in my life, my own life when I was I was not walking with God and, and I was miserable um, and finally getting right with him it was like this load lifted off of mm -hmm. me. it was wonderful but um, I'm thinking maybe those people if there's a, if they're close to death once they repent they that relationship has been sure. restored and so it's not immediately like the ungodly who, who I agree fully hope. And then the hope is restored. You can, you can restore that relationship like that. Yeah. Um, but not everybody has a chance. There are deaths where they're getting wrecks and, and God takes them out because of, or takes them out of this world because of, of their sins and stuff. Um, but yeah, the principle is, I guess, derived from that if you are in sin, you have built a problem between you and God. You built a wall, as I always say. And there can be no relationship. And so if you die in that, how can God um, give you the peace and comfort that he would want to give you without you being in a right relationship? Um, but if we're in a right relationship, now let me, let me stop right here because I've given some looks like you're taking this to a different level. We're not talking about salvation, okay? We're not talking about losing salvation. Uh, the difference... Once you're saved, you're always saved. We're talking about the relationship and how you allow God to deal with you. And if you're in sin, you limit that. But if you die in sin, you're still going to heaven. 
And I have some people that give me a hard time over that. Um, I, can, I can remember some people calling me crazy uh, uh, several times in my past when I was younger. And um, actually, surprisingly enough, I let them get away with it. Um, uh, I was, uh, I guess the Lord was very kind to me and, and didn't allow me to open my mouth in those days for those things. You don't lose your salvation, you're locked. I tell you before, it's, it's uh, conditional. Salvation is conditional until you accept Christ and then it's unconditional. <laughs> you're locked in Him. Uh, you, it's by His word, not by your acts that you're saved. But we're talking about a relationship in um like I say, I remember the deaths of, of certain people. I, I, you know, there's been some things that I have seen. Some people close to me have, I say close, I knew well. There was a man I, I actually spent, I had just gotten saved. I didn't really know enough. I spent time with him talking one day and and he was in a state of depression, and um, he asked me some questions about God and thought God had forsaken him and all this other stuff. Um, and I don't think he was right with God at that point. Um, I, I kind of believe he was saved. I, I don't really know, you know, because our relationship, being I was just saved, was not to that depth. And he committed suicide. Uh, you know, he shot himself. And because of that, um, that death wasn't immediate. It could have been hours before he died after he shot himself. And, you know, those things have a bearing on me because I see some things that happen when people are get separated from God and, and the works of the devil get in there and, and all these things affect their minds. And so I, I, I see, I, I understand and see this. And I know some may see this a little differently and I accept that and that's fine. But I do believe those that are unsaved and carnal uh, will die similar deaths while those that are in the bosom of Christ, that have that right relationship, have a, a totally different... Um, I just, this come to my mind. I, I just remember this. There was a, there's a preacher, and I, I, he's a, he's a, he was a black preacher, and, um, and he had a very comical way. This is recorded somewhere. Um, it was, a, it was a, uh, an audio of it. And he was preaching, and he was talking about a time when he was flying from Atlanta and got caught in a thunderstorm. And he said, and he was in a little cub craft, he said, and that craft went upside down, and said he was hanging in by his seat belts. He said, and I just started screaming and yelling. He said, but you know, I knew I wasn't going to die. He said, I didn't have any peace. He said, the peace of God was not in my life. And, he's, and he talked about that thing, and, and, and I said, yeah. When it comes time for those in Christ to die, and God's going to take them home, God's going to give you a peace. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. God's given us that promise in his word that he'll be with us. We just need to be sure that we're right with him. Um, anyway, uh, I'll give you one more idea as far as why dying um, in sin. And I, I've already kind of mentioned this in a different way, but I'll... I'll put it in a little bit different wording, why you die as an unsaved. Because the, if you die in sin, you're separated from God's grace. You're separated. You can't partake in something you're separated from. Um, so we have Abimelech, and, and he's, um, uh, he's uh, I, I want to go into something else uh, real quick, like, about death, about trusting God. Let me, would you give me some liberty for a minute and just give me a little bit of grace here? Um, I remember back in Bible college, we have books by um, Dr. Charles. I remember back in Bible college, he was teaching and he made this statement. He says, my wife will die before me. <clears throat> well, that's kind of interesting statement by a Bible teacher, by somebody who's been pastoring for 30 years to tell you. And he made this statement afterward. He said, I have prayed. He said, my wife and I have taught and I have prayed and asked God to take her before me because I didn't want her left after I died. He said, and God has given me peace that he will do that. God did that. I was a witness to that. Dr. Charles is still alive. His wife is only in heaven. He left an indelible memory in my heart. 
He taught me a truth. First of all, if God will do that, should we not be praying for our children to have the right mates? Should we not be spending time in prayer that those mates remain pure? Should we not be praying and asking God about our own lives and, and how they're to end? And there's so much to that. Um, and we tend to look at God as just for the present today sometimes. Sometimes we don't even look at him like that. But isn't this the God of yesterday, today, and forever? Should not we be seeking him in, in all these things? And I, uh, to me, um, he has convinced me to pray in our own marriage about when that time comes and, and what will happen. And, and I have, and, and, and I have peace that, in a lot of ways, that, you know, not, not that I've stopped praying for it, but I think God's going to answer that. And I'll leave that off. That was my liberty. So anyway, um, we talked about this armor bearer him drawing the sword should slay me that men not say of me a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through and he died. We, we talked about the life that he lived and how everything was consumed. He was a vain and empty man. Everything was about him. Even in his death that he was desiring for men to think better of him, which is not going to really happen. What was the last act he did? In this verse, what's the last act he did? Something frightful. <laughs> well, what does it say? Isn't, in a sense, he's committing suicide. Though. Well, I really, um, I'm, I'm looking at this last sentence. And his young man thrust him through and he died. In his, his, last, in his last act, he still showed no care for anybody else. You have a young armor bearer that had to bear his burdens in war carry his weapons of war. And that's why he lived. Now in death, he's having that man take his life. What was that going to do to the life of that armor bearer? What was that going to do for him to have to kill somebody that he had served all his life? I mean, and so in this, I still see, I still see a self-centered man. I still see one that's unrepentant, that, that it, he doesn't care about the burden he places on anybody, the cost that other people around him have to to, to bear. Um, I understand that how the armor bearer uh, would take that depend on his heart and his life and whether he was tender to the things of God, whether he was hard hearted. I understand that. But it's still a tremendous burden to carry all your life. And, and in this alone, did he not have a relationship with Abimelech in that? He would have been one of those that was with him in the thick of battles. Is there not a camaraderie when you go through things together that develops? And now being asked to do this as well. Yes, ma'am. Wasn't there another, I'm just thinking of another story. Was it Saul's armor bearer who he asked? Was it Saul? Mm-hmm. And he, he wouldn't. And so Saul had to fall on his own sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He so was unwilling to do it. And then the Amalekite claimed he did it and cost him his life because yeah. of his claim. So that's what I'm thinking, this poor armor bearer did it. I don't know because we're not really in the time of kings. Okay. We're in the time of judges. Yeah. Um, yeah, was not God he, well, yeah, that's not. There's, there's a lot in this but, um, that we could bring up. One, he was self appointed, yeah. he wasn't the king, but I do believe he's a judge. Um, but it doesn't really call him a judge in chapter 10. After Abimelech there arose to defend Israel. Um, uh, they do get down in, into a time when they begin to call um, uh, to judge. But at this point that is not here yet in our, in our passage. But it does say that Tola did judge Israel 20 years. Um, uh, so it's a transition I believe as we, as we go through. Anyway... Um, that is pretty good observation, but I, I don't know how they would have viewed that. It may have been a, a, an uptick compared to being killed by a woman. No, you understand because of the times there. Um, Boy, I don't know if I want to get in that conversation right now. I'd have to think through because there's when you're talking about taking your own life, and even in in like Saul and in, there's a lot of thoughts to that. 
Um, I'm just saying I don't think I could have done it. Well, see, that's what I'm... I would have just handed it here. You do it yourself. I don't think I could have done it myself. Take my own life like that. Well, you know, know but, but he, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I'm speaking for the armor bearer. Yeah. Um, that's a terrible weight to put on somebody. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, and we see that a lot today, don't we? Mm, there's a lot of people willing to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> that... <laughs> mm. So go to 55, but there, there, there's really there's a lot of application there. In 55 it says, When the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his place. When they saw that he was dead. I wonder what these men were thinking uh, right at that moment. This person they were following after, this person who was leading them. Um, you could say defender of Israel at this point. Uh, because of what it says in chapter 2, I'm, I'm not so big on, on saying that at this point um, about Abimelech. I don't think I'd ever come to a place saying that about Abimelech. And he was a defender of his name. He was a, a, a seeking for the things that he wanted. But now the, the man they followed was dead. And he, he didn't die at an old age, at a ripe old age. He died by the hand of a woman. Um, he is a younger man that they had followed and they had done things they should not have done. Um, my question I ask myself, did they remember the curse that God had pronounced upon Abimelech by Jotham? Did, did those things come to mind? You know, how much did God bring back to their mind? Because you can't say they was ignorant of all these things. They were involved in the killing of those 70. Uh, so they would have been uh, with Abimelech through a lot of this stuff. Um, I say majority of them anyway. So now, this person they've been following has been run through by his armor bearer because he was hit by a stone thrown by a lady. In one quick sweep, God destroys all the things those following Abimelech or even Abimelech might have uh, glorified in. Um, there was a, a glory that was given to death in battle. There was a glory um, of fighting and winning battles and taking the spoils of war. But now a lady, in one quick swipe, boom, she's brought all that to an end. God doesn't take, it doesn't take a lot for God to destroy the things of evil. God can correct us real quick in the most amazing ways. Um, so everything that Abimelech and, and even those following him might have gloried in, even in death, God took and he gave it to another. He gave it to a common, certain woman. Why did Abimelech end up where he ended up? Why did God do what he did to Abimelech? Why does God do what he does in our lives to us? Allowing us to go through things allowing us to face certain obstacles. Why does he do what he does? The Bible says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So. Yes, yes. He does what he does because of our choices. We choose, as she just said, to be proud, to lift up ourselves against God, to reject his word, to reject his ways to reject everything that he's tried to provide and give for us, how could he do anything but resist us? But those that will humble themselves and seek after God, um, he blesses, he watches over, he cares for. You know, I have a, I have a, a, a real childlike book um, written by Pastor Holloway. The Sheep Book. Do you remember the name of that book? You've got it with you? In here? Um, I would like everybody to have a copy. I really would. It's a child's book, and it's written about a sheep. And as you read this, if you can't apply it to the spiritual principles to life, it is an amazing book. Matter of fact, every book I've gotten by him, is, and he's only got a couple, um, have been a tremendous book. I've got this one. The Footsteps of Jesus, it's a guide for teens. That right there is an amazing book and teaches you things. 
I needed it. I'm not a teen, by the way. I needed it. The, 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 the principles in the Word of God are basic for life. And, and while it, it would be very beneficial for a teen to have it starting out, it was very good for me to have as well. Um, I appreciate the man's writing, but, but that book, um, they bring out principles and things that we can, we can take a grip on in our life and help us in our relationship with God, help us as we go through life. Just an amazing thing. Um, God has used him greatly already in my life. Um, that's another rabbit trail. Anyway, uh, let's take a moment, if you would, in, in, in thinking about how God has brought Abimelech's life uh, to naught, the curse that was given by Jotham. I want you to do a, a quick comparison. Compare his life to King David's. What do you say? What do you see? Go. Yeah. That's a, that's a very good observation. So I need you to define something for me then, because you said a key in here. David was a man after God's own heart. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? Seeking to please God. That's very limited. We got to go further. You know, there's, there's a lot here. What does it mean? He had a deep, intimate relationship with God in that he could pour out all his junk to God. I like your description, junk. <laughs> <laughs> he pour out his heart. Yeah, yes, sir. Well, I guess laying aside our own desires and our own wants and needs and whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think everyone, yes, ma'am. Crying, Abba, Father. Mm -hmm. That close. Let's, um, you've all focused on David. What is God's heart like? Love and compassion toward his people, and David is the king toward the people. His people? Well, God's people, but. How about all people? Now, I don't have any problem with this statement, but I think we need to open it. Is God's heart just loving and compassionate just toward his people? We weren't his people until he, <laughs> we experienced his love and compassion. So he's got a loving and compassionate heart. What else is God's heart like? Forgiving. Forgiving. Merciful. Merciful. Just. Just. Benevolent. Good toward all. Seeking the better, but he was David was still a man of God, um, a man of God. But he was also a man of war. We have a God of love, we have a God of mercy and kindness. But he is he a God of war? The wrath of God. He wars against those things that war against his righteousness. He wars against those things that would war against his children, his people. And when you take that and understand that David had a heart after God, not only did he seek to want to, to be close to God, but he was able to do that because of the unity, the, the similarities in how their heart beat, if I can say it that way, what they wanted. What does God, and I've said this over and over and over again, so if you get this wrong, I'm going I'm to really be hurt. Okay, you hurt my feelings. What does God want from you that he can't take? Ouch. Oi. A relationship. I think David wanted a relationship with God so bad. He was a man after God's own heart. God wants a relationship with each and every one of us so bad. The difference between, King, between Abimelech and King David was David sought after God with all his heart. He had all, and because he sought after God with all his heart, his heart was most like God's. But Abimelech did not seek after God. Even in death, he sought after the things for his own self-gratification. He was hardened to the things of God because it required him to glorify God and not himself. 
That's the world today, isn't it? The world seeks after self-gratification. And listen, what I say is right. It doesn't matter what you say, you're wrong. Isn't that what it is? People always say, I'm right and you're wrong. Well, how do you operate that way? Because if I'm right and you're wrong and you're right and I'm wrong, how can you ever have unity in this? It's nothing but a continual argument. And it's a fallacy. Who's right? God. God's Word. Anything where I'm in opposition to this, I'm wrong at. Anything that I don't agree with God, I'm wrong at. I mean, and I think David realized that. I think David was a special person in that he was very courageous. But I think he had a trust for God that, that was not seen in that day and probably not in ours. I think Daniel was close to that. Daniel had a little bit of different gifts, I think, but tremendous man. Somebody wants to say, okay. You know, sometimes we can look at David and think it almost seems like he was such a perfect man. But yeah. we know he wasn't <laughs> because of what he did with Bathsheba and he had all these concubines and wives. But I think I have to remind myself that it's not that he was perfect. It's that whenever God corrected him, like when he brought... Uh, Nathan, Nathan, you're David, the man. Yeah. It's not that David was perfect, but the minute God brought to attention the sin in his life, David was repentant. And so yeah. I think that shows the heart of him more than anything, right? Not that he never did wrong, but yeah. that he was willing to turn and repent when it was... And, and, and you just hit something that, that kept me hung up for a long time. And when I realized God says he's a man after my own heart, but yet I realized all the wickedness that David had done, especially in, in the idea of Bathsheba. Um, but you, if you look, Nirbal, I think it was, uh, come to David and he was going to help him get the kingdom back. He had been working with uh, 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 one of Saul's sons, the one that was crippled. Abimasheth? Yeah, Mephibosheth. Something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> I'd have to go back and read it. But David was quickly willing to forgive the man for any wrongs he had done. He was quickly willing to reconcile for the unity of Israel, for the unity of God's chosen people. Joab was not. And by the way, Joab was David's uncle, so he was in the family. So anyway... Um, I look at all this and, and realize that it's not the perfection that God is looking for to be after your own heart. It's, it's the willingness to repent and get back into that relationship because that's what he wants from us. I think I've preached relationship, relationship, relationship so many times that maybe it's getting too commonplace, but that is, that is the key, is it not? Mm -hmm. It's not that we're perfect. Nobody in here, nobody on, the whole, on this whole planet can say I'm perfect. I'm in good standing. But we can say, I'm in a right relationship with God if we are. you know. And if you're not, we can still get into that just as easily. So praise the Lord for that. Um, I really had a little spot here I was going to talk about the women. Maybe I wasn't supposed to. Anyway. All right, we'll, um, we'll stop right there and we'll come back for the service.